Good morning. It is great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, or this is your first time back in a while, or you're joining us online, we would like to welcome you. Uh, we are glad uh, not just to see uh, new faces or familiar faces, but uh, everyone here. Uh, I was just talking with Bill what uh, a blessing it is and what a privilege it is to gather together uh, to hear from the Lord in his word and to lift his name high. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do this morning. A couple of very brief announcements because I'm just excited to move on with the service at this point. Uh, we do have our quarterly members meeting uh, after the service today. Uh, so we encourage everyone to stick around for that if you are a member here. Uh, if you are not a member here or not sticking around for whatever reason, uh, I will remind you at the end of the service to try and leave uh, quickly uh, so we can get to uh, the, the boring business stuff at hand. Uh, I want to thank the Women of Grace for their ministry to us on Tuesday. Uh, they deep clean the nursery. I mean, they pulled out every single Duplo block and scrubbed it down. So thank you for doing that uh, and, and keeping that uh, room clean and sanitized there. Uh, Rick Garfola is going to be out in the lobby again after the service, uh, signing people up for the blood drive. We had quite a few sign up last week. I think we're about a third full at this point. Um, and uh, so see him after the service. If you can't stick around, if there's a line, if you just give him a couple pieces of information, uh, he will call you and set up a time uh, later on this week. Uh, and then finally, uh, two weeks from today, I will be starting that third Sunday school class. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. Uh, please sign up, uh, if not this week, uh, next week. Uh, that way we have no surprises. Uh, and we make sure we have enough room for all three adult Sunday school classes. Uh, and we will be looking at different areas uh, of what we believe of doctrine uh, and who God is, what he's done for us, uh, how the church is supposed to operate, what, what's going to happen yet in the future. Uh, and uh, it should be a great time. I'm, I'm biased in saying that. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully there will be some great discussions there. Uh, but if you are new to the faith, uh, or if you've been a believer for a long time and uh, just want a refresher course on some of these basic truths of the Christian faith, uh, we would love to see you there, uh, and I do ask that you sign up for that so we can have the space uh, as needed. Uh, but we are here this morning to lift our voices together, uh, to rejoice in God's uh, great blessings uh, in our lives, and of course, first and foremost among them, uh, is the Lord Jesus himself uh, with his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. So would you please stand uh, as we sing this morning uh, how he has made us glad.
Good morning. Today I will be reading Psalm 85, verses 1 through 13. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near. Those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from the heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good to our land and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way of his steps. May the Lord grant blessing to this reading. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, you are the only true God. How we praise you and your loving kindness and tender mercies that are new every morning, no matter where we are or how far we have fallen. You are faithful and you just and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us and to draw us back to you by your love and grace. Almighty Father, many in our congregation, family members and, and friends cannot be in church today. Some are ill, some are feel fearful, and others are hurting. You, Lord, are the great healer, and we ask that you provide your comforting touch to help alleviate these burdens. We know no healing is too hard for you, Lord, if that be your will. Lord, we ask you to bless Pastor Davy, lift him, strengthen him, and encourage him as he faithfully delivers your word to us this morning. Lord God, we thank you for loving us just as we are. Thank you for your, the way you care for us and that you will never leave us. Most of all, thank you for your son, Jesus, whose gift of salvation and eternal life for all those who believe he shed his blood and died for our sins. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. If you would please stand. Oh, for a thousand times.
one another, and Children's Church will be dismissed. If we have to start sitting any closer, your waves are going to inadvertently shake each other's hands anyway. Uh, in our Wednesday morning Bible study the past two weeks, we've been in Romans 6. Uh, and now the theme of Romans, uh, for those that uh, haven't made it out yet uh, on Wednesday mornings, uh, the theme of Romans deals with the righteousness of God, uh, our need for that righteousness uh, the, his provision of that righteousness, uh, and the permanency of that gift once given. And then at the end, how we should live out that righteousness in our daily lives. And we saw in Romans 5 a couple weeks ago, Paul makes the statement where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And he says that in Romans 5 verse 20. You know, in other words, if grace is needed, uh, where sin is involved, then a greater amount of sin requires a greater amount of grace. But as we turn the page to Romans 6, we saw Paul anticipate someone misinterpreting or misapplying what he just said. After all, if grace is magnified and increased and God is glorified by being gracious, if that grace increases where sin is present, why not as those who have been justified, those who are believers, why not just sin it up? If we've already received that grace, if our eternal life is secure, then, you know, let's just sin so God can continue to bestow his grace and we praise him for it. And if you've joined us on Wednesday mornings, you know what Paul's answer to that question, that proposition uh, was. And he says in the strongest of terms that such a course of action for a believer is never appropriate. That just because God would bestow grace doesn't mean that sin is excused because of it. You see, we live in the in-between as believers. If you have believed the gospel, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to take the penalty for our sins that we rightly deserved... And that it's only him, uh, in him, that our sins can possibly be forgiven. We look back and know that we have been justified. We look back and know that God has declared us to be righteous. And that when he looks on us, we are no longer defined by our sin, but by his declaration that our debt has been paid. And that he now can be on good terms with us. We have been reconciled. We are now friends with God. Yet when we look at our lives, and if we're being honest with ourselves, we under, understand the fact that we are not yet righteous. There are still areas in our lives where sin has a foothold, and that sin causes a strain on the fellowship that we have with God. It doesn't affect our relationship with God. Uh, that has been permanently set in stone by His grace and for His glory. But this ongoing sin that we have in our lives causes friction in our fellowship between us and him. It affects our peace and joy as believers. And sometimes it can even cause difficulties in our lives due to the consequences of our actions. We all know that sometimes when we sin, some sins have greater earthly consequences than others. And so while we await the Lord's return... And we await the perfection of our sinless bodies when he does. We are caught in the in-between. Looking back on our prior deliverance on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins. And yet needing the Lord to continue that work in delivering us in the present. As we turn back to Psalm 85, we see that we are not alone in this in-between the nation of Israel was looking back on God's great deliverance in the past and asking him to continue that work in the present. And since Israel was not only God's spiritual people, but a uniquely called physical nation as well, uh, those lines are often muddied as we read through the Psalms. Their physical blessings are often tied up in their spiritual state, and we should expect them to be so. Uh, if we were to read Deuteronomy 28 and 29, where God tells them, look, you will only experience physical blessings if you remain spiritually faithful. 
And so we see how those lines can be blurred as it uh, pertains to the nation of Israel. But for us today, we are a spiritual people with spiritual blessings. This morning, we're going to see Israel's continued dependence upon the Lord to finish the work that he started in them. And we'll see by extension that even as believers today, we must continue to look to Jesus to finish the work that he started in us. But before we dive into the word, would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come before you, as we draw near to your word, we ask that your spirit would illumine its words to our hearts and minds. We know that your word is timeless, that it speaks to us in our circumstances centuries upon centuries later. May our eyes be drawn to you. May our eyes be drawn to your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the grace and mercy that you have poured out on us through his sacrifice on the cross. May we rejoice in him and his work this morning, and we pray this in his name. Amen. If you haven't already, I invite you to turn back with me to Psalm 85, which Rick read for us earlier. Uh, It is important to me that you follow along as I preach or teach through a passage. I make mistakes. I don't make them purposefully, but uh, I am human. I am prone to error, and it is important that you read these words for yourself. And allow the Holy Spirit that dwells in every believer to teach you these things. And if I am found in error, that you would come to me and correct me. Uh, And so I I encourage you always to turn with me uh, where I turn uh, and, and follow up and make sure that what I say lines up with what the Word says. And as we turn to these psalms, as any passage of Scripture, uh, we we strive to put them uh, in their original context. What was going on when this was written? What was the culture like? What was going on in the history of Israel or or in the Greek and Roman era in which Paul and the apostles wrote? Uh, Many of the misunderstandings and misapplications of the Word of God take place because the reader doesn't understand the context in which a particular passage was written. So we don't apply the book of Numbers the same way we apply 1 Timothy. The book of Psalms is different from Revelation. Context is critical in understanding and applying the Word of God. So we usually begin in our Psalms by trying to determine when and why it was written so we can gain a fuller understanding uh, of the purpose of its writing. In the past three and a a half months as we've been in the Psalms, we've seen Psalms written during the exiles to Assyria and Babylon. Uh, We've seen Psalms written before those exiles take place. Uh, And in a few weeks, we'll get to one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 90, which was the only Psalm written by Moses, uh, which would have been written nearly a millennium uh, before many of these other Psalms. But Psalm 85 doesn't have enough indicators to tell us definitively uh, when precisely this was written. But as we uh, read through commentaries and see what other people with lots of fancy letters behind their name uh, have to to say, uh, there are two general guesses as to when uh, this psalm was written. And the one that makes the most sense to me, if we were to nail it down, or at least assume for the sake of argument, is that this psalm would have been written in a scenario Uh, such as the period in which Ezra and Nehemiah ministered, caught in the in-between of what has gone in the past and what is yet to come. Uh, Now, perhaps this is not the case, and I'm not willing to be burned at the stake for this particular uh, understanding of it, but circumstances such as that would make sense. And if you think back to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah and what was going on in the nation of Israel at that time, And in particular, if you think back two years uh, when we were in Nehemiah, the Israelites uh, began to return to the land after their exile. Uh, Due to their disobedience, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by Assyria in 722 B.C. Uh, And as the years went on, a a kingdom to the south, that of Babylon, rose up uh, and, and gained power and captured Assyria and took all of their exiles down to Babylon. And then Babylon itself went into the southern kingdom of Judah by 586 B.C., and because of Judah's disobedience, uh, God allowed Babylon, or decreed Babylon, really, uh, that they would take 
the southern kingdom of Judah into exile as well. And so by this point, the Israelites were out of the land, and God had removed them because of their disobedience and sin. And yet those exiles that we read about uh, in the prophets uh, weren't meant to be permanent. The Lord told Jeremiah the Babylonian captivity would be 70 years. And sure enough, by the time 516 B.C. rolled around, uh, there are decrees being issued that are allowing Israelites to return to the land uh, and rebuild. And so we'd have, if we were to apply this to this psalm in this way, uh, we'd have God's past work as described in verses 1 and 3. And I actually prefer the way that the NIV, a version like the NIV translates it uh, in the simple past tense. Uh, Psalm 85, verses 1 through 3, You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Now, again, we don't know uh, definitively when this was. Uh, I see this nicely fitting in with the return of the exiles back to the land. And the psalmist is looking back on God's past deliverance, and he says that not only has there been some restoration or return with regard to the land, but that the sin had been dealt with. He forgave their iniquity. And the Hebrew word here for forgave is this idea of lifting something up. And it's a great picture of what God has to do with our sins and and really what our sins are to us. Uh, There is this heavy burden uh, that their iniquity has caused. The sin is weighing them down and crushing them, and God takes it and he forgives them. He lifts it up off of them. He removes it from them. Psalmist also says that he has covered over their sins. And this isn't just a, uh, a blanket over them. Oh, well, I don't want to look at this, so I'm just going to take this heavy blanket here and toss it over there, covering it. I don't need to see it anymore. It's not stuffing them in a closet. It's not sweeping their sins under a rug. It's not ignoring their sins. It's God dealing with their sins. Sin must be dealt with. And it can only be successfully dealt with by God himself. And why is that? Why must sin be dealt with? And why is God the only one who can deal with it? And the answer to those questions is found in verse 3, where he says, sin brings about God's wrath, brings about his fury. His anger is fierce against it. It is burning and it is hot. And as we'll see in a few minutes, this isn't confined to Israel's sins and them being allowed back in the land. This is true for everyone who has ever lived on the most fundamental of spiritual levels. God hates sin. And it must be dealt with in order to have a right relationship with him. And he is the only one who can deal with it. And he dealt with it by sending his son Jesus to the cross. And we'll come back to this in a minute. But first, even after God dealt with their sins and Israel returned to the land, there was still an issue with them being obedient and faithful to him. We saw in Haggai this time last year, and I just want to take a moment and say how nice it is that I can actually refer back to past things that we've been through. I'm coming up on three years now, and we can look back on pa- our, our time uh, that in, in past years in Nehemiah and Haggai, and we are building together this understanding of the Word of God and seeing how it all ties in together to tell one story. But we saw in Haggai this time last year that during the time of Ezra, when they were supposed to be rebuilding the temple, the Israelites were instead using those supplies, that, that special wood that God had designed and designated for the temple, They were using it to build their own homes and to make their own lives comfortable again. There was still an ongoing work of obedience that needed to be done in the lives of the Israelites. Look at verses 4 through 7, and I'm back in the New King James now. Looking forward to this uh, next work that God must do. The psalmist says, "'Restore us, O God of our salvation.'" And cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? 
Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord. Grant us your salvation. Well, we saw in verses 1 through 3 that God had already restored them. And now the psalmist is using that same Hebrew word in verse 4, asking him to restore them again. And that word comes up again in verse 6, asking God to revive them again. And like I said, I'd argue perhaps that this would fit the circumstances of the time frame of Ezra and Nehemiah perfectly. God had already brought them back from exile, and now they're in need of some fine-tuning. Although perhaps in some cases the tuning was a little bit more major than just fine-tuning. But the psalmist asks God in in verse 7 to show them his mercy. He makes that request using his name, which most versions translate as Lord in all capital letters. Yahweh, the great God of the covenants, show us your mercy. And this word mercy here, I think love is how the NIV translates it, if I remember correctly, is the Hebrew word hesed. And again, we've talked about hesed before. And if there's one Hebrew word that every believer should know, I would argue that it is this word hesed. It's his faithful, it is God's faithful, loyal love that he shows to his people. It's not merely mercy, although it does involve not getting what we deserve. It's not merely love. It is this this idea of God's faithfulness to his people. It's his loyalty to his children, even if they're not loyal to him in return. It's a faithfulness that he he has towards his people because he promised to be faithful to them. We prefer when people keep their word, don't we? And hopefully we all have people in our lives whose word is golden, whose word is bond. They are trustworthy and reliable. And we probably also have the opposite. We have people in our lives whose word is sadly and unfortunately worthless. There are people in my own life that I, I, I think of when I say that. That as soon as something leaves their mouth, your first thought is, well, can they believe it? They're probably not telling us the truth. Or they're probably not telling us the whole story. You know, which one of those do we, do we prefer? We prefer people who keep their words. And when it comes to our Heavenly Father, the God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has revealed his name to us as Yahweh, the great I Am, his word is sure. His word is steadfast. He is loyal and faithful to that which he promises. And that's what's wrapped up in this word hesed here in verse 7. The psalmist is asking God to come through for them once again. Not because they earned it. Not because they deserved it. But simply because God is who he says he is. And he does what he says he will do. The Israelites were in between the already and the not yet. They've already been delivered, and now they need some more deliverance along the way. Our Heavenly Father restored them, but there's still some restoration that needs to take place. They've been washed clean, but there's still some dirt that needs to be spot cleaned here and there. Israel's position here in Psalm 85 is strikingly similar to our own. When we consider what God did for them in the past in verses 1 through 3, and what he needs to continue to do in the present, in verses 4 through 7, we quickly see that we, as believers, as followers of Jesus, are strikingly similar. Even as believers, we must continue to look to Jesus to finish the work that he started in us. As we glance back up at those first three verses, we know that we, uh, as the church, haven't been restored to a physical land. We aren't a physical nation the way the Israelites were. Yet as we look at verses 2 and 3, they could easily be said of us. Where the psalmist writes, You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. One of the necessities of the Christian life is continually drawing upon the knowledge that our sins have been forgiven. We have been delivered from them. 
The gospel is a foundational truth of which we must continually remind ourselves. It's not that believing in that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, died on the cross for our sins uh, is the starting point. And then we kind of sort of just uh, open up the filing cabinet and put it in a nice folder and stick it in there and close the, close the drawer and then move on with the rest of our life. We check it off the list. That's not the way it's supposed to work. It's not the way it's meant to be. A fruitful Christian life is not made by minimizing the gospel. And just as the psalmist is reminding the Israelites of God's past deliverance, his past work in their lives, so we too must keep our spiritual deliverance, our eternal life on the basis of belief in the gospel front and center. Our past grounds us in the present. And frankly, that is true in every aspect of our lives. Our past gives us an eternal perspective that this fleeting and temporal world will not give us. If we were to use the language of verses 1 through 3, Jesus forgave our iniquities. The crushing weight of sin was lifted up off of us the moment we believed in him. Our sins were also covered over. And while it's a different a word in the Hebrew, the concept is the same. We could say our sins were atoned for. No longer does our Heavenly Father just see us for who we are in this earthly realm, sins and all. No longer does He see us as dead in our trespasses and sins, but He sees each and every person who has believed in the work of Christ, He sees them as covered through the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood has covered us. So that when the Lord looks on us, he sees us as though he's looking at his son. He's seeing us through a layer of righteousness that was afforded us by Jesus. And so that even though there is still unrighteousness in our lives, there is still sin in our lives as believers, we are covered with this layer of righteousness that when God looks down and he sees us, he goes, oh, this person I've declared righteous. I see them that way. And as such, his wrath and the fierceness of his anger are assuaged. They are satisfied. They were removed off of us 2,000 years ago, and they were placed on Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And it is my desire and hope that this is true of every person here this morning or happening to watch online. And if not, there is nothing else that matters this morning. If the gospel hasn't given you life, if you can't look back and lay claim to Jesus and Jesus alone, if you can't, make, uh, if you can't say that, if you don't know that, make today the day of salvation for you. Believe in who Jesus is and what he did on the cross on your behalf and be assured of eternal life today. So that verses 4 through 7 of Psalm 85 can also apply to your life as well. Because once we have believed the gospel, once we have eternal life, and I know this is most of us here today, now what? Now our prayer is that of verses 4 through 7. Now that we are justified, we have been declared righteous, and sin is rendered powerless, now is when we wrestle with putting it to death. We have been delivered from the penalty of sin. We've been delivered from eternal separation from God. And now we must be delivered from the power of sin. Because here's the truth. We still sin. And that's one of the biggest criticisms that the unbelieving world has of us. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. You preach about righteousness and fairness and justice, yet you live like that. And our response should be, yeah, I know. That's why I still need Jesus working in and through me. We sin on a regular basis. And if you think you've made it through a day this past week without sinning, then I need to break it to you. Not only did you sin, but you sinned in thinking that you had no sin. I feel like the Apostle John speaks to that in 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There is an ongoing need for us to go before the Father and ask him to show us his mercy, to continue his chesed, and for him to grant us his salvation. 
And you know what happens when we do? God doesn't say, oh, you're coming to me again for forgiveness. You know this is the thousandth time this week you're doing this. I can't believe you're at this again. No. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful. It's a different word. First John was written in Greek, the Psalms in Hebrew, but the concept is the same. If we come before the Lord confessing our sins, agreeing with him that there is still sin in our lives and that we need his help to fix that sin problem, he will do it. He'll be faithful. And he will do it for us the same reason he did it for the Israelites. God is who he says he is, and he does what he says he will do. What hasn't changed between Israel and the church is that the God we serve has remained the same. He is still the Lord of us all. And it's the God who is the Lord of us all that is described in verses 8 through 13. God has never changed. And not only has he never changed, he's incapable of changing. And I invite you to follow along as I read about this God in verses 8 through 13. Psalmist writes, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not return back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good. And our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. As Israel came to the Lord, as we come to the Lord today, this is what we should expect. Verse 8, he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. When we come to him in our ongoing battle with sin, he speaks peace to us. He brings us wholeness. No longer is there enmity and strife, and it's not just the absence of those things, but it's the presence of wholeness as well. It's the presence of a friendship between us and God. It's the presence of a right relationship that we have with the creator of the universe. And yet the psalmist issues or offers this warning At the end of verse 8, and it's just as important for us today as it was for the Israelites, we are warned not to turn back to folly. That's what sin is. It's not one of the technical words for sin we see in the Word of God, but it is an apt description of sin. It is folly. It is foolishness. It is nonsense. In the same way, the Apostle Paul tells the Romans not to continue living in sin so that grace can increase. That such way of thinking is lunacy. So also the psalmist tells the Israelites, and he tells us today, that continuing in sin when the Lord is at work in us bringing about holiness, it is folly. Instead, in verse 9, we are told to fear him, that there is blessing to be had when we do. When we remain in awe of who he is and keep a proper perspective of, yes, he is our heavenly father and he has made us his friends, but he is still holy and he is still the sovereign Lord over all creation in front of whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It doesn't diminish the friendship that we have with him. It it doesn't make it somehow less than. It actually heightens Just how special and precious that friendship is with a holy God who would turn sinners into friends. Both are true. And as we talk about the God who never changes, and we look at verses 10 and 11, we see some of his perfections. Perfections such as mercy and truth, righteousness and peace. Concepts and attributes that seem contrary to one another or in opposition to one another. Ones for which it would seem difficult to strike a balance. Yet all of these perfections coexist perfectly in God. 
and in his son, Jesus. How can mercy and truth coexist? How can God know all about us in truth, in perfect truth, and know the standard by which we are measured, and yet withhold from us that which we deserve? To not cast us away from him the way our sins would demand. How can God be righteous? Indeed, he is the very standard of righteousness, according to Paul in Romans 1. And yet, I have peace with those who are less righteous than he is. You see, God is these very things. He is mercy. He is truth. He is righteousness. He is peace. He is not defined by them. They are defined by him, as are all of his perfections. I wish we could spend more time fleshing that particular statement out because it is a very weighty statement that, uh, that God is not defined by these perfections, but perfections are defined by God. But if you join my Sunday school class starting in two weeks, this is something that we will look at a little bit more, as well as all of the perfections of God. And if we were to get into it now, we would blow past lunchtime, no problem. And as you know, and as I said before, I get quite cranky if I don't eat on a regular basis. But suffice it to say today that in God is the perfect coexistence of all things good and holy, even when those things don't quite make sense in our minds. As we turn to him, as we continue to look to him to fix our sin problem, the psalmist says in verse 12 that the Lord will give what is good. For the Israelites, that would include an increase in what the land yielded. That was Part of, the, part of the deal, uh, part of what God handed down to Moses. You do what I say, you will have so much food, you will not know what to do with it. If you do what I say, you won't think there are any nations around you because they will leave you alone. For us, the blessings are far more profoundly spiritual than they are physical. And now the Lord may bless his children physically and materially. He may grant them those stewardships with which to be found faithful, but our primary blessing as a spiritual people, our primary blessings are found in the spiritual realm. As the psalmist writes in verse 13, righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. There is a great blessing to be had in fearing the Lord and trusting him at all times. The peace and contentment that can be ours in this life. The hope and joy that we have knowing what is to come when he returns. These things are worth far more than extravagance and comfort in the here and now. And he lavishly bestows these spiritual blessings on those that continue to seek him. Even as believers, we must continue to look to Jesus to finish the work that he started in us. As we've seen the past few weeks in Romans and we'll continue to see for a few more. So if you don't come out Wednesday mornings, come on out. We'll find room for another table. But we'll, we'll see that it's not sufficient for us to believe the gospel, to obtain that justification by faith alone, and then be content to sit there in spiritual stagnation. That is not God's good design for his children and the psalmist, writing a few centuries before Paul, wholeheartedly agrees with that testimony. If we rejoice in God's past work of deliverance in our lives, and we should, may we seek his deliverance again and again and again, day after day, week after week, year after year. It doesn't mean that we lose our salvation that if we have to seek God for deliverance once again, that we did something that we lost eternal life uh, and that we need to find it again and get resaved, that's not possible. That's not what the Word of God teaches. But we do need to keep our eyes on Jesus if we are going to successfully navigate this Christian life and experience the rich and abundant spiritual blessings that God desires to give His children. And Paul writes in Philippians 1, verse 6, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you have believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, he is not done with you yet. 
There's not one area of your life with which God is unconcerned. Eh, I'm not worried about that. That's separate from the way I deal with him. That's not what he says or how he thinks. He sees every part of your life and he is seeking to bring every aspect of it closer to him. And he will bring it about. Whether he has to do so dragging us, kicking and screaming through this life, miserable, wishing it would just end, or whether he does so as a shepherd, gently leading his flock through a foreign pasture, that's up to us, which path we take. Whether we want to go through this life with joy or go through this life in misery, either way, he's going to see us through. So why not seek him and allow him to do that work in us that we may reap these benefits? And as I read through Psalm 85 and I think about the ongoing sin in our lives and I think about keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord, Hebrews 12 comes to mind. Turn with me to Hebrews 12 as we close this morning. In the previous chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the author goes through a number of Old Testament saints and how their faith worked itself uh, out in their lives. And when we turn to Hebrews 12, we have a summary statement of Hebrews 11, uh, but then it's quickly followed uh, by drawing our attention to the one who is worthy of our gaze. Yeah, all those Old Testament saints were great, and they were men and women of whom the world was not worthy, but let me tell you, dear brothers and sisters, who is worthy of our gaze all the more. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Or as the psalmist would say, looking to God, looking to Yahweh. Looking unto Jesus, the author and what? The finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We must continue to look to Jesus. It's easy to see him as the author of our faith. Most of us here today are here because we recognize that our faith began with Jesus on the cross. He's the one we'll be with for all eternity. But the author of Hebrews says we also look to Jesus because he is the finisher of our faith as well. He is the one that brings it to completion. He is the one who, as Paul said in Philippians 1, that that brings all these things together, that he will not rest until he does so. We must daily turn our eyes to Jesus. Psalm 85, Hebrews 12, both of them draw our attention to the sin which so easily ensnares us. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the one who endured the cross for us. The one who despised the shame for us. And the one who has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God where he continually pleads our case as our great high priest for us. May we look back to the cross and rejoice in God's past provision. May we look forward to Jesus' second coming and his future provision of life with him. And may we keep those two things in mind as we look around us now. And we seek to live lives that are pleasing to him and honor him each and every day. Because he is faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you now, we praise you for who you are. You are the one in whom mercy and truth meet, in whom righteousness and peace kiss. In holiness and sovereignty, you are above and beyond all that we can fathom and more than we deserve. And yet, in your grace, in your love, in your kindness, you saw us in our helpless state and determined to act on our behalf. We thank you for your son, the author and finisher of our faith. May we not be content to think of Jesus merely in terms of what he did, but also in terms of what what he desires to do in and through us today. We thank you that you lose none who belong to you. 
Help us to live this week in light of these truths, in a bold and confident hope, hope that you are who you say you are, and you will do what you said you will do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close this morning's service with turn your eyes upon Jesus. bow with me in a word of closing benediction. And now to him, the eternal God of our salvation, who has delivered us from our sins and who has promised to continue to do so, to him be all glory and honor and majesty forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. If you're sticking around for the meeting, please stick around and hear. If you're not, uh, please exit quickly. Uh, And Rick is going to be out in the lobby uh, taking down information for the blood drive.